is a former congressman, U.S. senator, and presidential candidate. He's been a leading voice for the voiceless, standing up for those struggling in, the, in this economy, protecting life at every stage, and fighting to ensure that our nation is secure from all of those who wish to do us harm. In 2012, he and his wife Karen co-founded Patriot Voices, a grassroots and online community of Americans committed to finding ways to restore the American dream for hardworking families. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome a true American conservative statesman, best-selling author, and a great friend of the family, Senator Rick Santorum. Uh, well, thank you all for sticking around. I know it's uh, way past everybody's bedtime here, and uh, I, I appreciate you uh, being here. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for me uh, to come and, and be, again, I think I have been at every Value Voters Summit, and uh, it's an honor to be back. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a sadness that I come here. I, uh, I know others have mentioned it, but I have to. My, uh, my dear, dear friend, uh, Phyllis Schlafly, and, uh, passing away this past week, and uh, her uh, memorial service and mass being tomorrow, and I, I feel really bad that I can't be here, but I just had to point out, uh, you want to talk about the original value voter. Uh, is Phyllis was uh, really iconic and a great leader for our movement and someone who I can tell you inspired me. Uh, she was not just a great leader and obviously founded Eagle Forum and and, and boosted the conservative movement at a, at a very difficult time in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but she was someone who was similar to our nominee. She was an anti-elitist. She realized that uh, elites in our society were corrupting our culture uh, in a variety of different ways. And she never quite fit with some of the Republican establishment uh, that, uh, that many others in the Republican and conservative movement did. And so, uh, I, I really, uh, she was a bit, a, a bit of a precursor, if you will, uh, to, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the struggle that we're seeing uh, in this election cycle. I want to mention somebody else that is a, a dear friend who passed away uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, and that's uh, another person who, with his wife, uh, Beverly LaHaye, started another great movement, uh, which was Concerned Women for America. And Beverly, along with Tim LaHaye, uh, really were great champions, again, early on in the conservative movement to, uh, to bring values uh, into the conversation of conservatism. Uh, so we didn't get off into a libertarianist type direction, but stayed as a real complete conservative movement that had an anchor of the importance of life and marriage and the culture. And so uh, both of these giants will be missed. And I, I want to mention Tim in particular because I had the privilege this past year and a half of working with Tim on a very special project with him. Uh, Tim, as you know, uh, along with Jerry Jenkins, wrote a very uh, popular series of books called Left Behind. And uh, as you might remember, uh, I have been involved in the movie business for a while. Well, one of the movies we have made uh, is, a, uh, is a movie called Vanish, The Next Generation, which is based on Tim LaHaye's book, uh, Left Behind, the, the uh, Tribulation series. And so what I'm going to do for you, this movie comes out. Uh, it's a one-day uh, showing on September 28th in theaters across the country. And I just wanted to, uh, to share that uh, trailer with you right now, and if they can cue the trailer, and so you can look at uh, what Tim LaHaye and I have concocted for you. Isn't it crazy how much we can get caught up in our own lives? Not really noticing the things in front of us, and taking for granted those around us, and not realizing how our entire world can change in an instant. doesn't make it, you have to keep going. It's gonna be okay. High school feels like a hundred years ago. We have restored calm to the world under one government, one currency, one belief. He scares me. He scares me too. Because we 
I got lucky. Maybe it wasn't just luck. Maybe it was something more than that. What's with the gun? For protection, it is better to not ask too many questions. <gasps> what? Oh, that's my dad. Sid, get him, get him. If anybody finds out what we've been doing, it's gonna be bad. No one's gonna find out anything because we're gonna find them. We really have to leave. <laughs> It's a dark time. Everybody's asking, why am I still here? If we stick together, we'll find out. Thank you. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to Y, letter Y, letter I, excuse me, letter M, Y M I Still Here dot com. And you can uh, learn it. And that's sort of how I think many social conservatives are feeling these days when it comes to politics. Why am I still here? Uh, because things have been getting worse and worse and worse. As I mentioned before, I've been coming to Value Voter Summits for I don't know how many years, I think every year they've had them. And every year, as we look around the culture in America, things continue to degrade. The values that we hold and we cherish, the Judeo-Christian values that built the greatest country in the history of the world, which were the bedrock of our society, strong nuclear families, the idea of respect for life and the dignity of all life, the family relationships and marriage, all of those things seem to be disintegrating. And then we wonder, why there's such unrest and discontent in America, why there's so much violence, why there's so much disunity. It's because the things that hold us together are not holding us together as they used to. And the question is, well, how did we get here? I mean, we have to take responsibility for this, ladies and gentlemen. It's been on our watch. I look out here and I see some folks with gray hair, some with actually no hair and some who have been at this a long time, but we're not making progress. And here's what I would suggest. It goes back to what I was talking about with Phyllis a little earlier. The principal problem that we've had is that the elites in our culture, those who have, are at the levers of control, if you will, or those who are in the levers of influence, have begun systematically to turn and change this country. Just like in every great civilization, particularly ones that are founded on faith like ours, founded on the idea of God-given rights, founded on the concept of individual liberty and freedom is that people start replacing the God to their God themselves and start to believe that it's them that are the, the great things that make the world work well instead of getting on our knees and thanking God for the blessings that we have. And so what happened, and it's, it's been a very clean and predictable path. It started with our elite universities. That's where the elites are, and they have systematically taken over colleges and universities. There's almost, you can almost count them on one or two hands, the number of colleges and universities in America that aren't just completely secular, elite, politically correct institutions that don't teach American history, not the American history that's the truth. They don't teach the values that made our country great. In fact, they don't teach anything that we believe. And yet, what do we do? We continue to support them. Many of you probably give money to them. And we have government programs that subsidize them in the billions and trillions of dollars through student loans and student aid to inculcate values into your children that are everything you don't believe in. And we sit silently by. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has had consequences over the, over the decades. Because those universities train our leaders. They train our leaders in business. Is it any wonder why when in Indiana or in North Carolina or in a whole bunch of other states when they try to pass religious liberty, the business community stood up? and fought. Why? Because they're trained in these same universities. Hollywood, where do you think their training comes from? The news media. All of these organizations do not share your values. 
do not share the values that made our country great. And they're the elites. And they're now telling you, not only don't they share your values, but your values are bigoted. Your values are sexist. Your values are discriminatory. And in fact, because they're such, we're not even going to allow you to practice those values because they're so offensive. That's we've gone from tolerance to intolerance, to adherence, as we continue to sit and allow it to happen. But something happened. And it wasn't the agent that we thought it would be. But it was an agent that said, we are no longer going to tolerate the political correctness of the elites. And it came from a source that we would not have expected. Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Himself arguably an elite, but someone who recognized all of the junk the left has perpetrated on America needed to be called out for what it is and did so in a way that was crude, but at least to the elites. If you look at the folks who don't support Mr. Trump in this election within the conservative movement, who are they? They're the intellectuals. They're the elites who are offended by his style and his manner. It wasn't Phyllis Schlafly. She endorsed Donald Trump early. Why? Because she recognized that he was tapping into something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we are going to be successful as a nation, we have to get in solidarity with the people across this country, you, who are being discriminated against and will continue to be even worse so than today, those who have been discriminated against in the economy, who have seen their why trade deals and immigration, seen jobs shipped overseas and people coming into this country by the millions. Do you know how many legal immigrants we allow in this country every year? Legally, over a million a year. And according to Hillary Clinton, that's not enough. We're not creating a whole lot of jobs. And we're not creating a whole lot of good paying jobs at a 1% growth in the economy. But there's plenty of room for more people to come in to keep wages down, for the elites in business to make their profits as Wall Street continues to go forward. This is what Trump has tapped into. And believe it or not, values voters, you're part of it. Value voters are part of the anti-elitism. It's a new coalition. It's not a coalition that has ever been put together, certainly under the Republican banner. But it is a banner that is the only chance, ladies and gentlemen, the only chance for the people to rise up and say we are no longer going to take the political correct liberal secularism that is being jammed down our throat every day. So I encourage each and every one of you to think about this election more broadly than just your issue or issues. And think of it as a little bit of a mini revolution within the Republican Party and within America of no longer allowing the elites in either party or both parties to dictate to us what is best for us anymore. And if you have any doubt whether Donald Trump is someone that you can trust on the issues you care about, understand first the paradigm shift that is his campaign, the anti-elitism that is his campaign, and his vow. And you heard him repeat it here from this very podium today. The most important issue from, uh, from the standpoint of elitism in government. If you think about it, we have three branches of government. Which branch of the government is the elite branch of government? The one that's farthest removed from the people. The one that's less accountable to the people. The one that only the highly educated, highly intellectual are selected to then rule for us. 
the Supreme Court of the United States? Is it any wonder that that court, that branch of government, has been the one that has jerked us down the road to radical liberalism? Why? Because they're the elite branch of government. They're not accountable to the people. Donald Trump understands that. You may say, well, I'm not sure how pro-life he is. I'm not sure how pro marriage He understands the elitism of the court. And he has put forward a list of nominees that is a fabulous list of people. And by the way, I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Not a single one of those people on that list went to an Ivy League law school. And by the way, I think everybody on the court did, maybe with one exception, go to an Ivy League law school. This is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. And Donald Trump, as unusual, as those of us who are social conservatives and have been in the field and the trenches for a long, long time would see it, is in fact the answer. The question is, can he win? And the answer is, that is up to you. I can tell you coming from Pennsylvania, he can win Pennsylvania. Because I know a lot of very wise people, working men and women, and they're not angry. They love America. I hate this characterization that all these Trump supporters are angry people. They're not angry. They're rational people who are looking and saying things are not working for me as well as they should be. And they can work better. And we need to get back to basic values and throw off the chains of the elitist, secular, liberal world. Ladies and gentlemen, I call on value voters all over this country to understand the battle that we're in. We lost Phyllis Schlafly, who understood that battle, battle better than any. But in her memory, go out and fight. This race is so winnable. All we need to do is keep our eye on the ball. A big change in Washington. A throwing off the shackles of elitism. A Supreme Court that reflects the values of our founding, not those of the European Union Constitution. Donald Trump said it and he's right. And I'll finish with it. This race, if we lose, Hillary Clinton will appoint a new Supreme Court justice. And that will create a 5-4 majority that will begin a process. And the process will be continued because there's two other liberal justices on that court, both of whom are advanced in age, and I have no doubt will retire during the next four years if Hillary Clinton is president. And she, those two will be replaced with two other 50-somethings who are as liberal as the other two on the court right now. There will be five 50-something-year-old radicals on the court who believe the Constitution is at best an annoyance and at worst a document that should be shredded on the ash heap of history. They believe the Constitution isn't worth the paper it's printed on. And that's how they now rule. Donald Trump said it today, and I echo it, if Hillary Clinton is elected, those five justices will be on that court for 25 years. And you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are sitting on the side and say, I can't vote for somebody because, well, pick a reason. You will be responsible for the end of a republic because our Constitution will no longer stand. You have one shot. It may not be the shot you wanted. It wasn't the shot I wanted. Remember, I ran. <laughs> I wanted the perfect candidate, but I lost. <laughs> so I have to take what the American public gave us, and they gave us a chance. They gave us a chance. 
seize it. God bless you. Thank you.